Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Please subscribe, leave a review, comment, share, and consider supporting the podcast on Patreon, even at the producer and sponsorship levels. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Anne-Marie Schrouder, and we explore her recent book, Being Brown in a Black and White World, Conversations for Leaders on Race, Racism, and Belonging. Anne-Marie Schrouder, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Hi, thanks for having me, John. Yeah, it is a pleasure to be with you. I'm super excited for this conversation, and you're joining us from Barbados, of all places. What a wonderful place to be, and uh, I'm super jealous. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah, so we're in the midst of you know cold and winter, though actually the weather's quite lovely, so I can't complain mm. either. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. We're going to be talking about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging efforts in organizations you know, from a more general landscape, but more specifically, we're going to be exploring uh, your recent book, being Brown in a Black and White World, Conversations for, leading, uh, for Leaders on Race, Racism, and Belonging. Uh, super interesting perspective that you bring to the table, and I'm super excited to explore that with you. As we get started, I wanted to share Anne-Marie's bio with everybody. Anne-Marie Trouder has dedicated her life and career to assist businesses in creating healthier cultures so both the business and the employees thrive. She has worked for more than 20 years in the field of diversity and inclusion, and as an international speaker, facilitator, and consultant. Anne-Marie has guided thousands of people using her signature methodology to create inclusive environments. Her warm approach and transparency soothes participants, generating opportunities to lower defenses and open lines of authentic communication. She is a master at building belonging and safety in business environments, allowing for greater connection, dialogue, and sense of community. And certainly we know the world needs much more of all of that. So that's wonderful. Uh, it's, again, a pleasure to have you joining me today. And I appreciate you being willing to share your insights with me and my listeners. Anything else you would like to share about your background or personal context before we dive on in further? Sure. Um, I'd like to share that I'm Canadian. I'm in, I'm in Barbados. Luckily, I don't know if luck is the right word, but I'm grateful to be here um, this year in support of my nine-year-old who um, we came down for COVID and she just, as a child of color, to be around people of color all the time, she just blossomed. So um, since work yeah. is still virtual, we're back. Yeah, that's but wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, Toronto is a pretty diverse city. Uh, so it's not like she hasn't had the chance to be around diversity, but of course it is a different thing when you, um, you know, you're day in, day out, you're surrounded by people who are like you. I imagine that's a, a wonderful thing. Yeah. So. Well, you, you might know a little bit about that. Oh, I'm certainly, I, I'm right? a, a white, I'm a straight <laughs> cis white dude. So I'm certainly around people who are just like me all the time. <laughs> yeah. It, it really makes a difference. You know, I, I've lived abroad. I've lived um, for extended periods of time in, uh, per particularly in uh, Asia, Southeast Asia countries. And yeah, it, it does, you know, it, it's just different to be like the, the one white dude in a sea of, um, of Asian people, as has been my experience. And I, I've never really had negative experiences that I can point to. It's, it's been a, a lovely opportunity to, to travel and live in, in those countries. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely is a different kind of an experience. I, I certainly don't want to equate that, though, with the experience of people of color in the United States or, you know, in, in the Western Hemisphere who, who might experience issues of 
uh, inequities and racism and those sorts of things. Cause that really hasn't been my experience. Um, and again, I'm a white dude. Um, so I come to this conversation really to learn, uh, from you and to, to hopefully facilitate a nice conversation, but I really look forward to your perspective. Thank um, you. So as we, to our chat, yeah, yeah. yeah. So as we get started, um, uh, maybe we can start with just defining a few things. Sure. Um, certainly, Race, uh, racism, diversity, equity, inclusion, these are all things I think most people are fairly uh, comfortable about, but comfortable with, but we have, you know, these terms microaggressions, we have implicit biases, um, those are getting more and more traction in the workplace and getting discussed, but I, I still hear them kind of misused a lot. So maybe we can start there, you can define those and it kind of give us some examples of what those look like and how that plays out in how we interact with each other, and then we can go from there. Okay, sure, we'll start with those, but I do wanna circle back to the, the D and the I and the R, because <laughs> I think most of us know what those mean, but not everybody does. And, and that's, I think that's part of the reason why we haven't seen more movement in this regard. So microaggressions, those are you know daily, sometimes really subtle ways that we let people know that they don't belong. It could be an action, it could be a comment, um, it could be um, the way that we're treating someone, but they, but they are often subtle and so they are hard to catch. Sometimes even as the person on the receiving end of the microaggression, they're hard to catch. I can't remember who coined the term, but it was coined specifically for people of color. It's, it's expanded to, to apply to folks in marginalized communities or historically disadvantaged communities. And I don't love the term because the micro part suggests that they're small and potentially insignificant and they're not. And because they can happen very often, just because of how societies have been created and, and what we know and don't know and the, and the value that we have learned to give people based on systems and structures, um, the effect is cumulative and can be quite uh, damaging. If I can just comment on that too, like you said, with, with the fraught terminology of microaggressions, and I, I totally agree, the cumulative mm -hmm. effect can just be uh, disastrous for, for people. Yeah. Um, looking at it from the standpoint of the, the, the one who's doing the behaviors or saying the things that are microaggressions, they don't always recognize they're doing it because they're Absolutely. small, little, subtle things. Um, and it, again, we'll talk about implicit bias here in just a second. And, and it, oftentimes they come from those places of implicit bias Yes. Um, but, the, but those who are receiving it don't often see it either if they're not attuned to it. And what yes. that's really problematic because then you have someone who just uh, is absorbing it continually, mm -hmm. not necessarily recognizing what's happening, but the overall weight of it still presses down on them and their psyche and, you know, it has implications for self-worth and for, you know, their overall mental health and all of those things. And that can be really damaging. And, and sometimes though people who don't recognize what they're experiencing as they're experiencing it. Sometimes they're even the defenders of those who are perpetrating, um, you know, th these, these behaviors that are hurting them. They're yeah. defenders of the very uh, behaviors because they don't recognize the damage that it might be doing. And so then it, it becomes a situation where like, for example, a, a woman who's in a, in a culture or environment where there's heavy misogyny may be one of the first defenders of that environment. Mm -hmm. Um, because she thinks, you know, she's a strong, powerful woman and she, she doesn't, you know, she doesn't let that stuff get her down. And, 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 and so she can set aside these, these harms that are maybe hurting other people who aren't in a position or don't have some of the same privilege that she has. And then they're being hurt by it and it's not getting corrected. The systems, the structures, the norms aren't being corrected. And of course that can be incredibly damaging. So again, not, not to derail from, from focusing on people of color, but just as an example, it, it, yeah. it these microaggressions aren't small. They, they have cumulative effect, as you said, um, and it can be very, very damaging. So we need, definitely need to be proactive about figuring out how to counteract them. Absolutely. And they can be, you know, they can be environmental as well, right? If you're in an environment where there's just you and, and everybody else is not like you, that's also a microaggression because it's, it's the underlying message is you don't belong. You don't have as much value. So if I'm the only woman, person of color, fill in the blank in a, in a, in a group, in a, in an office or, or what, on a team, then the underlying message is, huh, like you don't value women enough to have more. You don't value people of color enough. Like, why am I the only one here? And, and you're right. There's, it's so subtle 
that even those of us that are impacted by those microaggressions don't get them. But I bet you we're impacted even though we don't realize it. Yeah. And that's going to, like you said, weigh on us. It impacts um, our self-esteem. Like you said, it impacts our sense of self. It impacts how we see ourselves. Yeah. And it's very closely linked to um, implicit bias or unconscious bias where we can go next, if you like. Yeah. Awesome. Let's, let's go there next. And, Um, and I should also just note as you so, um, so well articulated a minute ago, I didn't mean to brush over the fact that, yeah, there are still plenty of people who don't fully understand diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, like how these things are actually different from each other. Um, I I spend a decent amount of time sharing with people about that uh, when I'm doing, you know, workshops and organizations because they conflate things and, and you have to be able to pull it apart in order to address it. Right. For sure. For sure. Yeah. So, um, so implicit bias, those are the biases that we, that we, that lodge in our brain and, and inform how we see people, how we treat people, how we might respond or not respond, react or not react, the assumptions that we make. And in, in trying to create an inclusive environment and a diverse environment, they can, they can take us out at the knees because we're not aware, right? The, the implicit part or the unconscious part means that it's lodged in there. But if I were to shake you awake in the middle of the night and say, you know, do you have a bias against black people or do you have a bias against women? You'd be like, no, I don't. <laughs> and we would mean it, right? We really, because our conscious brain has a different message going on, but our subconscious brain or our unconscious brain is where these, these uh, mental associations between identities and adjectives, um, the, who can be a leader, et cetera, et cetera, are lodged. And we use those to make most of our decisions in the day, right? The subconscious brain is, makes the thousands of decisions per minute versus the, a few um, 10, 20, maybe 40 a minute that the conscious brain does. So we need that subconscious brain and it can really get in the way of our efforts around inclusion and equity because these mental associations are lodged in there without us knowing, but we use them, we act on them. <clears throat> yeah, and on the one hand, it's, it's, it's a way to, to have some patience, empathy and compassion um, and, and uh, be a little generous towards people who are, perpetrating, you know, words or behaviors that are, you know, microaggressions and and might be hard for other people. It's a way to, you know, if we can acknowledge that these are, these are implicit biases, unconscious biases, uh, then we can say, okay, you're you're not trying to be sexist, racist, bigoted, whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. It doesn't excuse the behavior. It doesn't excuse the words or any, or any of the, the outcomes and impacts of what you did. Um, But we can have now, now we can, take a little step back from the finger pointing and judgment enough to actually talk about it and explore it and figure out how to fix it. So that's one aspect that I like about um, the conversation around implicit bias or unconscious bias. What I don't like is that sometimes people then lean on it and they say, well, it's implicit bias. It's unconscious. There's nothing I can do about it. So I'm off the hook. <laughs> it's yeah. just, in, it's just ingrained in me and there's, it's not my fault. There's nothing I could have done um, to, to, uh, to not have those biases. And so therefore it's not my problem and you just need to, to grow a thicker skin. So I hear people say that kind of stuff and that's not the point either. Like we're not trying to give people a pass We're we're trying to recognize where these things are coming from and acknowledge them so that we can move forward in a productive way. So how, how would you respond to someone, uh, who maybe says there's nothing I can do about it. It's out of my control. Even if their best of intention is I want to do better. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Academy. Courses, micro credentials, and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. All HCI Academy courses, micro credentials, and certificates are designed, developed, and delivered by award winning and internationally renowned scholars, educators, thought leaders, executives, and practitioners. Our courses, micro credentials, and certificates will help you make your mark on the future of work and make an immediate impact in your organizations check out the HCI Academy and our many course offerings and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. Check out our new weekly 
LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us. Well, I'm, I'm a big proponent of awareness. Uh, when I work with organizations, I have a signature methodology called the ABCs of inclusion and the A, one of the A's that, one of the things that A stands for is awareness. So I think it's important for all of us to be aware that we have implicit bias or unconscious bias and to, to cultivate an attention to be able to start to hear it or catch it or see it as we are moving about our day. Yeah, that's not easy but it's possible to do um, and something that I encourage all the folks in my sessions um, to start paying, you know, pay attention to the voice, the one that's nattering onto you all the time and, and happens like this, right? Very, very quickly. This, the minute somebody walks in the room, the voice is going on about what they're wearing and what their attitude looks like. And we have a story about that person within, within seconds that we think is true. That's an implicit bias, everybody. You know, that's what that, we, that is. That, that we think is true. That's the real problem, isn't it? <laughs> that we think, yeah. And then the, the next problem is we don't check it out because we think it's true. We think we're right. So we just go on our merry way using that story, those judgments, those assumptions to then judge, assess, make decisions about that person for that person, et cetera. So the awareness piece is, is critical. Practicing that awareness and then challenging what you're hearing. You know, like, do I think that? Hmm, really? <laughs> you know, those kind of questions and, and really digging into those. And it's not fun. You know, it's not fun work. Um, I think we, we are all, um, most of us are doing our best. Yeah, most of us are really trying hard and, and, we're, and we're open and, and we want to be welcoming. Um, the challenge with unconscious bias is that we're, we're doing things based on that frame of reference that is so ingrained that is undermining our desire to be welcoming and, and, and showing people the exact opposite. Yeah. So it requires our awareness. It requires a commitment to do that work, to keep being aware, to keep challenging ourselves and, and a, a willingness to hear from people when, when our actions or words have impacted them in a negative way. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I, and I really like, again, uh, how you frame that as, you know, these things that pop into our head that we believe are true. Um, and so we don't challenge them. And, you know, on the one hand, something might pop into my head. I can't necessarily what pops in over time. I can retrain myself to, ha you know, to think differently, but, but, you know, right now I acknowledge, okay, I have a problem. I have a bias um, towards this particular person, this group of people, whatever um, you start to just have awareness so that you can challenge that assumption that pops yeah. into your brain and you can say, wait a minute, I actually have no basis for making mm -hmm. that judgment or <laughs> coming to that conclusion. I need to challenge that way of thinking and, and just be with the person with, you know, who, who they are as they are. And we can, we can interrupt that thought process. Um, and over, and over time we can retrain the thought process, Absolutely. but it does take a, a tremendous amount of time and effort. So yeah. While I'm going to give people a little bit of leeway and I'm going to have some compassion towards individuals who are working towards this, especially say another white dude like me who has just all sorts of privilege and maybe hasn't spent a lot of time thinking about this stuff. We need to kind of help them along. Uh, mm -hmm. If we just throw them under the bus and say, you're a sexist, bigoted prick, then, you know, that's going to just put up barriers and they're not going to try and, and nothing's going to improve. So we can have a little bit of patience and compassion for people as they're trying to learn and grow. But we can also expect that over time, yes, you can learn and grow and get better <laughs> and, and you can improve. And regardless of what the intention is, mm -hmm. I can have the best of intentions, but if I'm doing or saying things that hurt people, I need to own that and be accountable for those impacts. Uh, so, in, so intention matters. I want to have good intentions, but we have to get past intention. We have to get to the impact of our behaviors and we have to be accountable for it. And unless we can hold ourselves and others accountable for those things, it, it, and it doesn't mean I have to then say, okay, you're a flaming racist, but I, you know, I, I don't need to go there, but I, I need to be able to point out the problems and expect more and expect better of people who are being problematic. Absolutely. And I, and I think it bears uh, mentioning, I agree with everything that you said. I think it also bears mentioning that unconscious bias impacts some people negatively and impacts other people positively, 
right? Because those assumptions that are popping into our head and the things we think are true could be negative or could be positive. And those are dependent on our identities and our social location and, and how systems have been set up, right? You know, because my book is about race, we're, we're more likely to experience the negative impact of unconscious bias as racialized individuals in a society built on whiteness, yeah? So I think it's important to remember that um, unconscious bias impacts all of us. It just impacts us in different ways. Yeah. So as a person of color in a North American context, I'm, I am more likely to be impacted negatively by unconscious bias. Um, as a female, I'm more likely to be impacted negatively by unconscious bias. Um, but as a, as a male and as a white male, you're more likely to be positively impacted by unconscious bias. So um, I think that's important for people to remember. Um, so yes, we want to be patient with folks. We want to give folks the opportunity. We want to meet folks where we're at and give them the opportunity to learn and grow um, into their commitment and participation in equity, inclusion, and diversity. Um, and, you know, that doesn't mean you get a free pass. You don't get a free pass, right? There's, there's some accountability. We, we know that intention and impact are not the same. Yeah, we want to acknowledge the intention, but we also want to focus on the impact because if somebody's impacted, we need to, we need to address that, so... Yeah. And, and again, it gets to sometimes the implicit biases can influence how we set up things, the, the processes, the structures and the systems that, that then have can, incredible negative impacts on people. Um, and, and, you know, I was just, I, I was uh, working with a group, they were, you know, needing input on hiring processes and interviewing and, and it's a heavily uh, male dominated, um, industry and, and their particular group is heavily, it's like 95% men. <laughs> and so they have the same, they want to have more women. Um, they want to have more people of color uh, than right. what they have. And, and so their aspiration is good. Their intention is good. Mm -hmm. And then they're going through the hiring process for a new position. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, well, you're a little limited in your ability on the hiring committee because you don't have very many women. So that's, but that's going to impact things. You have to be extra aware <laughs> of what For you're sure. trying to do. And then I look, you know, I'm looking over things. I'm like, okay, you're not interviewing a single woman. Um, and they're like, well, gender has nothing to do with it. It's just, these are the requirements. These are what we're looking for. And this is who has that. And so it's just, you know, we're picking the best people, but it just happens to be all men. I'm like, well, wait mm -hmm. a minute. Let's challenge mm -hmm. that. Yeah, let's challenge that a little bit. <laughs> like, what, what are you actually saying is most important and why? Right. And because while maybe gender wasn't the first thing on their mind, um, mm -hmm. it, those implicit biases form their other expectations and what they're saying is most important, which then influences how they're scoring candidates and ultimately Absolutely. who's getting an interview. And of course, then you have people who aren't even getting the opportunity to be interviewed, let alone be hired. And it's no right. wonder that they have this perpetual cycle of having pretty much all men, right. And pretty much all white men. And so we need to be able to disrupt those things. And the only way we can is if we acknowledge it and then we can say, mm -hmm. yes, I'm going to proactively make an effort to challenge assumptions, challenge you know, the systems uh, that need to be challenged in order to actually provide equal opportunity for people, not just give lip service to it. Absolutely. And that, that's the beautiful thing about having representation around the table right? When you have representation around the table and your environment is inclusive, right? So the diversity is about the representation. The inclusion is about how it feels. Are you hearing from people? Do people feel comfortable and safe to speak up? When they speak up, are they heard? Are they taken seriously? Are their ideas used, considered, right? Are we, are we then doing things differently or, or trying something new? Um, when we have that representation around the table and the environment is inclusive, then we have the opportunity to hear about some of these um, things that we haven't that we haven't thought about before. Different ways of doing something, you know, the 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 blind spots, if you will. Try not to use that word as much anymore. But the the things that we miss that are not on our radar because of who we are in the world. There's nothing wrong with that. We just have a very narrow experience of the world based on. Yep. you know, how we show up in the world, who we are, and that's fine. But the beautiful thing about diversity in an environment that's inclusive is that there's so much we can learn about what we've missed, how that policy impacts this person differently. And we never would have thought about that because it works fine for us. Okay, right. so what else do we need to know? Okay, let's, let's see how we change the policy. Is it, is it just about language? Is it about content? You know, it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity to acknowledge people 
and to create spaces where they can thrive. Um, and without that representation and the environment that allows people to speak up, there's so many things we just don't know are missing. Yeah. Very well said, Anne-Marie. And we've just scratched the surface, but I note the time and I'm going to have to let you go here in just a moment. You're welcome back anytime we can continue the conversation and we can dive more into how we start to go about changing things. Um, But before we close for now, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your work, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. For sure. Well, my my website is creatively called Anne Marie Shrouder.com. <laughs> so it's easy to find me. Um, and I'm on LinkedIn as well. So people can find me there. When you hop on my website, you'll notice that one of the first things is I have a newsletter that comes out every week that's free. It pops in your inbox. It's called the Inclusion Insight. And my goal is to help you see differently, notice more, pay attention. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where I am in cyberspace anyways. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. It's just been a pleasure talking with you. I appreciate all of your insights. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Bluer than indigo leadership, the journey of becoming a truly remarkable leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue, what some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There is no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of your problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for your individuals, teams, and organizations. alchemy of truly remarkable leadership, ordinary everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years with increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition. The average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. enjoy the human capital innovations podcast please subscribe leave a review comment share and consider supporting the podcast on patreon even at the producer and sponsorship levels thanks again for joining us for this episode of the human capital innovations podcast i hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week
check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us.